So now let's give you an introduction to balance and equilibrium. Now, the structure associated with balance and equilibrium is the vestibular apparatus. That's what it's called. And the vestibular apparatus, the vestibular apparatus uh, consists of two main structures. It consists of the semicircular canals, number one. And if you look on the next page at the top of 81i, it consists of the utricle and saccule. Very strange words. There's a lot of strange words in both the structures for hearing and the structures for balance and equilibrium. Let's first, uh, let's show you a picture of what these are, and then we'll explain what they are. Look on the next page, 81J. 81J. So we're looking on the bottom picture of 81J. This is the inner ear. This, uh, these are the structures of the inner ear. And in the inner ear is the cochlea, the thing that looks like a snail associated with hearing. Uh, and uh, the rest of this, other than the cochlea, is called the vestibular apparatus associated with balance and equilibrium. The vestibular apparatus consists of three so-called semicircular canals. Three semicircular canals. These three semicircular canals are oriented in the three planes or dimensions of space. Everybody should understand this because you've been all watching 3D movies lately. All right? What are the three dimensions? So the three dimensions are this. What am I doing? You'd say, I don't know, acting silly like usual. <coughs> I'm moving horizontally. Horizontally. This we might call the x-axis. And you will notice that one of these canals, and I'm not, I'm not going to test you on the name of the canals, but this one right here is labeled the horizontal canal. That would be the x-axis. Now, what's another way I could move, move in a silly way? Up and down, vertically. And you will notice that one of these canals <laughs> right here is labeled the superior canal kind of like superior, inferior, up and down, vertically. We might call that the y-axis. How? What's the third dimension? The third dimension, I can walk towards you or away from you, all right? And so I, another way of saying that is I can move anterior or posterior, front or back. So you'll notice that the third canal is labeled the posterior canal. That would be the z-axis. You might say, what do you mean x, y, and z? So in math, this would be the <laughs> x-axis, the y-axis, and then there's a z-axis. That's what I just drew, x, y, and z. So, um, so horizontal, vertical, and the one coming straight towards you and going into the board. So that's how these three semicircular canals are oriented. In addition, you will notice there's something labeled the utricle and the saccule. This thing, whatever the heck it is, is called the utricle, and this thing, whatever the heck it is, is called the saccule. And together, these structures form the vestibular apparatus, and you will notice coming off all of these structures is this vestibular nerve. Inside it are millions of myelinated nerve fibers that join up with the cochlear nerve, and together they form the vestibulocochlear nerve, or cranial nerve number eight. So now we want to learn what are the, let's start with what are the semicircular canals for, and after we explain them, then we'll explain what the utricle and saccule are for. So uh, let's, uh, on page, back on 81H, back on 81H, there's another great picture of the X, Y, and Z axis. Uh, so on page 81H, We wrote that these three canals are oriented in the three planes or dimensions of space. Each of the canals is filled with fluid called endolymph. And you might say, wasn't the cochlear canal for hearing also filled with endolymph? And the answer is, yes, it was. So it's similar. 
Also, the, uh, the purpose of these canals is they are sensitive to rotational movement. To rotational movement. And we're going to see that just as the cochlea had hair cells, the semicircular canals have hair cells. To help us understand this better, let's make a note to see page 81N. So here's 81N. Now this is showing a semicircular canal. Uh, it's filled with fluid. Now, right up here, this part of the canal is bulging a little bit. Where it bulges, where it's enlarged, is called the ampulla. I don't really care that you know that word, but where it's bulging, it's called the ampulla. What I do want you to know is what's located in the ampulla are hair cells. Again. Again, you'd say hair cells, weren't they in the cochlea for hearing? That's right. And they're in the semicircular canals as well. They're called hair cells. They're really, they're sensory neurons that have little hairs or cilia. Now, whenever the fluid starts to move, if fluid starts to flow in this canal, it bends those little hairs, just like sound waves, right? Fluid waves in the cochlea bend the little hairs, and that's going to activate them to send action potentials to your brain. So I wrote bending of the hairs causes action potentials. Now, we have a horizontal canal that will inform us, you see, what if I were to start rotating like this, spinning? All right, if I start spinning horizontally in a clockwise direction, that's going to cause this fluid to start to flow in a clockwise direction in the horizontal canal. Does everybody follow that? Yeah. And even if I shut my eyes, I will feel that uh, spinning, right? I don't have to have my eyes open. I will feel it. And in fact, I don't even have to be making myself spin. I could be, in, I could be having somebody spin me. Or I could be on a roller coaster that's spinning. And even if I shut my eyes, I will know that I'm spinning. Now, I could have not only spun this direction, I could have spun in the opposite direction, right? That would also make the fluid move, but it would move in the opposite direction. Does that make sense? It would flow in the opposite. So how does our brain know which, it, obviously the hair cells in our horizontal canal will inform the brain that we're spinning in a horizontal direction, but how does our brain know whether we're spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, to the right or to the left? That's answered by looking at the bottom picture. All right, what it shows here on the bottom left is it shows a guy, and he's not spinning. He's just looking straight, right? He's not moving. These hair cells are sending impulses, action potentials, at a constant rate. When he's not moving, we say that these sensory neurons are tonically active. They're just firing off action potentials at a certain frequency. Now, when he rotates his head, as shown on the far bottom right, oops, okay. when he rotates his head in one direction, what happened to the frequency of action potentials sent by those hair cells? It increased the frequency. But when he rotates his head in the opposite direction, what happened to the frequency? It decreased. So in other words, if he's stationary, it's firing off like this. If he rotates his head one direction, it actually gets slower. If he rotates it in the other direction, it gets faster. We're not going to worry about which direction you know, you're moving makes it this frequency of impulses increase or decrease. But that's how your brain would know which direction you're spinning in. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. How it's able to, you've got this mechanism, so it's the change in frequency that when that information reaches your brain, your brain from the horizontal semicircular canal, so your brain says, I'm spinning, and because the frequency is either going increasing faster than normal or becoming slower than normal, I know whether I'm spinning clockwise or counterclockwise. Now, remember, you have semicircular canals in all three dimensions of space. So not only are you, do you know whether you're spinning clockwise or cl counterclockwise, you would also know if you're rotating forward or rotating backwards, uh, vertically in space, or in terms of the forward or backwards. So uh, going back to page 81H, 
So in 81H, the vestibular apparatus, you have semicircular canals oriented in the three planes or dimensions of space. There is endolymph in these semicircular canals. Rotational movement, what is known as rotational or angular movement, of the fluid inside the semicircular canals bends the hairs of the hair cells, sensory neurons, activating them to send action potentials to your brain. So they are going to inform you whenever you're turning your head, whenever you're spinning, either clockwise or counterclockwise, if you're rotating forward or rotating backwards, and all these things. So in other words, when you go on a roller coaster, so when even, it, sometimes you know, it's, wow, it's scary. I'm just going to close my eyes. It doesn't help. <laughs> because you feel when you're going up. You feel when you're going down. You feel when you're spinning. So if you've ever been like on Magic Mountain, at Magic Mountain, they have a, one of the roller coaster rides called the Viper. Oh, yeah. You ever been on the Viper? Like now, the Viper not only goes up and down, but it rotates you from side to side. And they have also some that turn you totally upside down. Is it right? Is that right? Which one does that? that we go, you're literally going upside down. As you, is that the Viper? So anyhow, yeah, they, have, they have a bunch of different roller coasters. So the whole idea is they're activating all three of these canals. So you know whether you're going spinning clockwise, counterclockwise, going up, going down, right, going sideways. And so you're just, it doesn't help to close your eyes. You know exactly all this motion that's happening. So these are the semicircular canals informing you of all this rotational movement that might happen. This also, where this also happens is, and we could demonstrate this, if, if we were to spin you, right, we start doing this, and then I stop you real quickly. The room will still continue. You still feel like you're doing this, moving. Why? Because the fluid is still moving in those canals. And it takes a while for it to slow down. So until that fluid stops flowing, and as it's flowing, remember, it's bending those hairs. You still feel like you're moving, right? And that's why, because that fluid is still moving in the canal, activating those hair cells, and they're still informing your brain. You're still spinning. Now, uh, on page 81i, on 81i, we said that the vestibular apparatus not only consists of the three semicircular canals, but also what's called the utricle and saccule. Now, uh, one of these, uh, the utricle, and I'm, I'm not asking you to know which one's which. The utricle, one of them is oriented horizontally, and the other one's oriented vertically. The purpose of the utricle and saccule is to inform you about gravity and linear motion, to inform you about gravitational pull and acceleration and deacceleration. That means speeding up and slowing down in a linear direction, not rotationally. Now, it involves little otoliths. What are otoliths? Odo means ear, and lith means rock or stone. There are little rocks. You ever hear this English expression, what do you have, rocks in your head? <laughs> well, you do have rocks in your head. So to help you understand this better, let's look at page 81O. Page 81O. All right, this is, on page 810, this is what a utricle and saccule basically look like. A utricle or a saccule is like a little sac, right? It's made up of cells. And uh, these cells have, want to guess? Hairs. They're hair cells again. You'd say, again? Yeah, you see, you'd say, you mean, we had hair cells for the cochlea for hearing. That's right. We had hair cells for the semicircular canals for uh, uh, a rotational movement, spinning, right? Right. And now we got hair cells for this again? That's right. Now, not only do we have these hair cells, this cavity is filled with fluid. What do we call that fluid? It's called endolymph fluid. You'd say, didn't we have endolymph fluid for uh, the cochlear canal? Yeah. Didn't we have endolymph fluid in the semicircular canals? Yeah. And now we got endolymph fluid in the utricle and saccule? Yeah. Now, also, floating in this fluid is a rock. This is called an otolith. 
It is made up of calcium carbonate, so it's a calcareous rock, a little rock. <clears throat> now, fundamentally, this device is a gravitational detector because since gravity pulls things down, right now, this rock is going to be pulled down and it's going to bend these hairs of these hair cells, and they're the ones sending action potentials to the brain. Now, what if we turn you upside down? If we turn you upside down, where's the rock going to go? This, because that up will now be down. And it's going to bend these hair cells, so now your brain knows that you're upside down, because your head is where the gravity is pulling. If you were to tilt your head, like, so, like let's say like this, then the little rocks move here. If you tilt your head the other way, the little rocks move here. So they're moving here or here, and no matter how you turn your body, your head, that little rock is pulled by gravity. So you will always know up from down. You will always know the direction of gravitational pull. Now, if you're still not quite certain about with this whole thing, this next, this, next thing, I mean, wait a second, this next example is really going to clarify. What if you were in outer space? Oh. Is there any gravity in outer space? No. There's no gravity. Where will the rock be? In the middle. Floating in the middle. Because there is no gravity to pull it in any direction. So since the little rock is just floating, then none of the hair cells are being activated. So you won't feel any up or down. You won't feel any gravity. You won't feel any up or down. And guess what? There is no up or down in outer space. There's no gravity. So it's exactly right. So this is fundamentally informing you of gravitational pull. These are really fascinating devices. Like a gyroscope. Yeah. Now, this, because you, now you have a uh, utricle and saccule. Uh, and uh, let me go a little bit, uh, uh, OK. Now, they, there's one more thing that these little rocks do. Let's say that you got in a car, you're in a car, and you're going to floor the accelerator. When you hit the accelerator, start going forward real quickly. It, you are pulled backwards. If you don't believe me, try it. When you get in the car, hit that accelerator pedal, and as your car goes real fast, you're pulled backwards. So that means when you accelerate linearly, this little rock moves backwards. So it moves. Now, if you hit that brake, you know how your body moves forward when you hit the brake? Right? You slow down. If you don't believe me, try this. Okay? Hit that. You're going go 75 miles an hour. And then hit that brake all the way. You're going to fly forward. So that little rock is going to move forward. Does everybody follow that? So that little, this mechanism is also going to tell us when we speed up or slow down. Let me give you an example of what we're talking about. Let's imagine you've been blindfolded and thrown into the trunk of a car. <coughs> You're in the trunk of a car, blindfolded. If the car starts to move forward, will you feel it? Yes, you can feel when a car starts to move forward. Would you be able to tell whether the car is moving forward or moving backwards? Yes, you would. You could feel this linear, straight line acceleration or deacceleration, whether you're going forward or backwards. So if you're in the trunk of a car, you're going to feel when that car starts to move or lunge forward, or if it goes into reverse and goes backwards. As he speeds up, you'll feel it. Every time he hits the brake, you're going to feel slowing down. But what's really interesting is that if the car gets on the freeway and it's a good car and it's going at a constant speed, you won't feel movement anymore. You can only feel speeding up or slowing down, not constant speed. Let me give you another example. You get on an airplane. Can you feel when an airplane takes off? Of course you can. Can you feel when a plane slows down and gets ready to land? Of course you can. But when the plane is flying at a constant speed of 600 miles an hour, you don't feel the movement. You only feel what they start to speed up or slow down. And you are going in a plane six or 700 miles an hour, but you don't feel it. 
but you do feel it when they start to when they take off and speed up and when they slow down. That's called acceleration and deaccelerate. Now, I mentioned that you have two of these. One's called a utricle and the other's called a saccule. And the best analogy I can give, one of them is oriented horizontally and the other's vertically. And the best example I can tell you of what that's for is to think of a carpenter's level. It looks like this. And it's got something that's shaped like that and something that's shaped like this. And there's a bubble. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that allows you to set it on a table and know whether the table's tilted either from side to side or front to back. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So if you were going to go and put position a shelf on a wall, you would want that shelf to be per perfectly level. So you would need to not only make sure it's level from side to side, horizontally, but also that it's not leaning forward or backwards, tilted. All right, so that's, these are in your head, and you've got them on both sides of your head. So now that you've got, and incidentally, the pictures at the bottom are just showing you, depending upon where that otolith is, uh, how your uh, the position, what's up from down, it activates different hair cells. So let's summarize what we've just been talking about. Uh, back on page 81i. On 81i, so the utricle and saccule inform us of gravity and acceleration and deacceleration. You see, every time you start to accelerate, that little rock moves. And when you hit the brake, the rock moves. So it moves in response to uh, accelerating, speeding up, or slowing down. If you don't understand that, uh, just set a, uh, a, any bottle on a, 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 your car seat and speed up and the bottle will uh, uh, move backwards and then hit the brake and it'll go the other direction, right? It's responding to uh, acceleration and that's what the rock is doing inside your head. So uh, the otoliths cause bending of the hairs, activating the hair cells to send action potentials to your brain. So examples are tilting your head forward, backward, sideways. It allows you to sense up from down. And here I even ask, where would that odo, where would the otolith be pulled in an individual in outer space? The answer is they wouldn't be pulled in any direction. They'd be just floating in the center of the utricle and saccule because there is no gravity, there is no up or down. And you wouldn't feel it. So uh, you do feel speeding up or slowing down in a car. How about if you were blindfolded and placed in an elevator? Would you feel when the elevator starts to move? Could you tell whether the elevator was going up or down? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. OK, so the, uh, the, the, the idea is, so uh, again, these play this role in telling us about the position of, uh, of how we're moving. So in summarizing, the semicircular canals and utricle and saccule provide us with all this spatial information, kinesthetic information, about uh, a, a rotation and spinning, about uh, acceleration and deacceleration. And uh, that's, this is what we experience when we're on a roller coaster, and even when you shut your eyes, you still feel all these movements. All right, what about the neural pathway for balance and equilibrium? The neural pathway from the vestibular apparatus is very similar to the pathway for hearing. The nerve fibers travel out in the vestibular cochlear nerve, but instead of going to the uh, cochlear nucleus in the medulla oblongata, instead they go to the vestibular reflex center in the medulla oblongata. Then the signals go to our old friend the thalamus, at least that's always consistent. And then they go up to the primary sensory area in the parietal <coughs> lobe of the cerebral cortex. In anatomy, you learn the parietal bones are on the top of your head, and the parietal lobe is at the top of your brain. So uh, I, let me try to com contrast uh, the neural pathway for uh, balance and equilibrium from the vestibular apparatus in contrast to uh, the, the neural pathway for hearing from the cochlea. So again, let's look on 81M. 
I didn't include a picture. I did not. But let me see if I can contrast it with this picture. The information from the cochlea went from the cochlea to the cochlear nucleus in the medulla oblongata to the thalamus to the side of your brain, the temporal lobe. What about from the vestibular apparatus here? It would go from the vestibular apparatus through this vestibular cochlear nerve, but it would synapse not in the cochlear nucleus in the medulla oblongata, but a place right nearby called the vestibular reflex center in the medulla oblongata. <coughs> from there, the nerve fibers would decussate and go to the thalamus, and from the thalamus, they would go straight up to the top of your brain. So I didn't include a picture, but it's similar. It's similar. Let me just add one thing here. Uh, the back on 81i. So here's how I summarized it. On the bottom, uh, the signals go out through the vestibular, this 81i, go out through the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve number eight, first to the vestibular reflex center, and then I'm gonna add right in here, they're going to decussate, just as they did in the neural pathway for hearing, as they go up to the thalamus, and then they go to the primary sensory area, which happens to be located in the parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex.